on this edition of Native Report. We learn about Spirit of the Ojibwe, a special book devoted to the elders of the Lacoudere Band of Lake Superior Ojibwe. We visit the Kafapoto Plank House, a traditional Chinookan-style cedar structure. As long as there's a desire in the heart and a commitment, then all is possible. And we learn how the best practices for revitalizing the Maori language can also be applied to other language preservation efforts. We also learn something new about Indian country and hear from our elders on this Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community, the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe, and the Blandin Foundation. Welcome to Native Report, I'm Stacy Thunder. Spirit of the Ojibwe is a very special book by Sarah Balbin about 32 elders of the Lacoudere Band of Ojibwe. Told through stories and portraits, their histories are compelling tales of adaptation and triumph. On this hot summer day, Dancers made their way into grand entry at the 39th annual Honor the Earth Homecoming. What makes this gathering a special event for Sarah Balbin is the presentation of her book, Spirit of the Ojibwe. I have um, always been an artist, um, and I don't say that lightly, um, but I didn't claim the term artist until I was older, but um, by the age of 15, I was already commissioned for a life-size painting in oils. Um, I was pretty accomplished, pretty young. Um, one of the things that I have um, is that I'm pretty passionate about what I do. Um, and I don't know if that's something you can learn. It's just something inherent in me. And once I start a project, um, I need to finish it. And the Elder's book, Spirit of the Ojibwe, um, from beginning to end to its publication, took 15 years. And, and that was the passion, that was the dedication that I think you need if you're going to be an artist. And the results have been really quite nice. Um, it's been embraced by the Tribal Governing Board and the community of Lacoudere and other uh, tribal members. Spirit of the Ojibwe has been described as a multimedia cultural artifact. It contains the history of Lacoudere in northern Wisconsin with the centerpiece being 32 portraits of elders and their accompanying biographies. Twelve of the paintings were on exhibit a week before the Honor the Earth Homecoming. Originally it was just going to be the paintings of the elders, which are allegorical paintings, and uh, meaning that um, each painting um, speaks about who the elder is, who the per person is that is portrayed. Um, with their environment, with their clan, with the manner in which they dress. Um, it's a description and, and you can read the painting and see who that, the history of that person. The decision of who was to be painted was done by the Tribal Governing Board. The beginnings, um, and, I, and I love this part of it, um, because nothing was planned. Everything just had a very nice innocence and evolution. Everyone was comfortable with everyone, uh, the timing was right, and um, it just blossomed. Sarah uh, has been with our tribe for many years, and uh, when we were starting the school, she uh, worked on a grant to uh, add a dimension of art to the program and uh, so we got this great idea about uh, commemorating the historic value to the school and the community and what better way than to 
uh, record the images of our elders and also research some background on their values, their heritage, um, their genealogy. Of the 32 profiles in Sarah's book, Dr. John Anderson is the only surviving elder. Today, he had the honor to formally announce the publication of the book. There's so much to know and to see. I wish we had time to discuss and talk about them because um, many of them I knew personally, like Henry Smith, senior, he lived next door to me. He was a woodsman extraordinaire and a hunter and a fisherman, a guide. And he had a lot of knowledge about the environment in which we lived. And he and I were on the council at the same time. And he was, he was an elder then, and I was just a young guy, you know, trying to do something that I thought I could, which was uh, maybe advance the uh, situation with our tribe. Henry was my mentor. I think it's time to recognize our elders, because taken from the Code for Long Life and Wisdom, it says, honor elders, that's the second tenet honor elders. In honoring them, you honor the gift of life and wisdom. There's no question that um, the value of the book is going to have a searing impact, I believe, on young people. Uh, the people who we have that are dancing at this powwow and singing at this powwow behind us, uh, they have an interest. They have an interest in our heritage. They they feel a sense of duty of carrying on that part of our culture. The people that were selected to be portrayed in this book, of course, uh, out of the 32 are some of the truly remarkable historic people on this reservation. The paintings tell a story. That's why they're allegorical. Every one of the elders, everyone is dear to me. Did you know that the Maori are the indigenous Polynesian people of New Zealand? In the 2006 census, there were over 600,000 Maori, making up roughly 15% of the population. They are the second largest ethnic group in New Zealand after the European immigrants. The Maori are active in New Zealand culture and society, but disproportionate numbers of Maori face economic and social obstacles. Health problems, shorter lifespans, educational underachievement, and higher rates of crime among the Maori have triggered a governmental response aimed at closing the gap between the indigenous population and the rest of New Zealand. Starting in the late 1800s, the government required Maori children to be taught English, and missionaries ran their schools. But beginning in the late 1970s, the Maori sought redress for past grievances and fought for social justice. They asserted their sovereignty and fought to have their language and culture taught to their children. Starting in 2004, the government began funding a television network that uses only the language of the Maori. In the 2006 census, the Maori language was second only to English as the most widely spoken language in New Zealand. Next, the Kathlapolta plank house is a full-scale Chinookan-style cedar structure. There once was a time when longhouses were numbered in the thousands along the Columbia River, but now only this replica remains. This house is a Chinook plank house, and it's made entirely of western red cedar. This is a representative house of a village that was about a mile and a half from this site down on the Columbia River. They had 14 houses, uh, this being about a mid-sized house. This is 80 foot long. Uh, there were houses as large as 200 feet long. That village down there was called Gothlapoots. Uh, today the, it's translated more like Kathlapotl. 
the title of this house is the Kathlopodal Plank House, but Kathlopoots was the village's name, and it was noted by Lewis and Clark when they passed through this area on, towards the mouth of the river. On the sunny day, an eagle flies over the Ridgefield National Wildlife Refuge, where a replica of a traditional Chinookan structure, a plank house, sits. These houses traditionally would have been from the mouth of the river, as far up river as the timbers were available. Um, thousands and thousands of these houses along the Columbia River and actually up. Uh, usually Chinooks control upwards of five miles or so up each major tributary. So there were houses up there also. So just lots of these houses all over the place. Some very large villages, some, some houses were temporary summer houses. This house was actually a collaboration of um, partners, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, which is the property here is the refuge property. So Fish and Wildlife Service, the Chinook Indian Nation, and uh, PSU were, were involved as a partnership. And this actually came about as a result of the Lewis and Clark Legacy Project at the time. It was a monumentous undertaking in that um, the amount of timber that it took, um, probably upwards of 30 truckloads of cedar, had to be, for the most part, gathered through uh, donations. And so when I hired on as the project manager and tribal liaison, early on in the project, a big part of my responsibilities was the gathering of that cedar and making contacts with uh, national forests and national parks as a way to try to find enough cedar to put the house together. And I think we finally wrapped up in March of 2006 by the time it was erected and um, we had the openings in the house. We referenced um, both uh, just passed down information through the tribe, but also um, there were a number of drawings and references from early explorers and people that visited the region, even Lewis and Clark, uh, for example. Paul Kane did a number of fairly detailed uh, structural drawings. The painting on the front side is a welcoming figure. The round hole is the traditional entrance to the house and in most houses that's the only way in or out. And its positioning uh, makes it difficult to, to rush into the house in an attack situation. So anybody entering is rather vulnerable. They have to lower their head down to get in through that door and you know, that puts them at the disadvantage to whoever might be inside waiting. When a guest arrives, a guest enters the house in a traditional way, which is to enter backwards with your, your head bowed down to get through there. And because you're so exposed at that point, it's, a, it's an honorable way or you know, humbling way to enter the house. This house represents a being, a living person. And when you enter the traditional door as we did, you've entered the poor end of the house. And you'll notice on these beams, as they, the support beams, as you progress towards the wealth end of the house, things increase in the amount of decoration. So this first pole is fairly simply decorated. Um, the next pole is painted and has some design elements on it. The pole after that is heavily decorated on both sides. And then the final pole is the most decorated, the largest carving. What you see on this post is a representation of, of the owners, the house owners, or the headman's parents. This being his father on this side, and on the opposite side, a very similarly carved figure representing his mother. Carved in very traditional Chinookan elements that help uh, distinguish the Chinookan art style from, say, Coast Salish, Puget Sound Salish, uh, exposed ribs, and these geometric zigzag forms and, and kneecap type elements, uh, the facial features are all very classical uh, Columbia River art style. And beyond that, on the big carving in the back of the wall, shows a, is a representation of the owner himself. Of all his wealth, he's wearing a, a cougar skin robe. He's got a belt on with a double bladed knife. Uh, and up above, he's wearing a headdress with representations of his tamanawas or spirit power which are showing wolves. So it's just a, an elaborate carving at the wealthiest end of the house, showing the, the extreme wealth and, and status of that individual. 
The Plank House is open to the public throughout much of the year. It is also used for the Chinookan Winter Ceremony. The tribe is, um, uses it for their primary winter gathering ceremony in uh, January, which commemorates the time when we moved from our out, outside activities and moved into the houses to do our winter dances and our storytelling and um, preparing for that next uh, spring's harvest of fish and goods. And so that ceremony is very important. Uh, we'll have upwards of 300 people in the house. Both fires are going. This is about the size of, for this house, two fires. Some of the longer houses might have an additional fire pit. But like a modern day kitchen, these were kind of the hubs where people gathered around and had their meals. There were usually three meals a day served. So what you see on this side are bunk sleeping quarters but they also doubled as storage. Underneath a lot of planks of these floors, there would be actual storage pits dug. On this side, would have been an exact duplicate of that side. They would have both been sleeping quarters and storage quarters. We put bleachers in here to help accommodate some of the larger gatherings that we put on, such as the winter gathering that we mentioned. To me, because it's the only existing truly Chinookan house. I'm quite proud of the fact that it's, that it's here, um, that the public is able to come and get a true understanding of what our culture is about. And to know the house could be here for a hundred years, you know, that's an awful lot of uh, people influenced and impacted uh, by this house. If you think about the present day capital of New York is Albany. Well, Albany was also the uh, traditional historical capital of the Mohican Nation. And um, by reference, when Henry Hudson, uh, like in 1609, came up what is now the, called the Hudson River, uh, it was uh, the Mohicans he met um, uh, right in the Albany area. So that was where uh, our ancestors um, uh, said they hung the fireplace, the center of the nation, but yet the territory and the groupings of the tribes spread over a very vast area from uh, north of Albany uh, all the way down the Hudson River and, uh, uh, and eventually into uh, you know, New York City where we were joined together with uh, the Delawares or the Muncie. So Stockbridge, Muncie, and Mohican and Muncie uh, coming from New Jersey. And so there's a very vast tract of territory um, that was home. According to the Enduring Voices Project, every 14 days a language dies, and that by 2100, more than half of the 7,000 spoken languages on Earth, including the many not recorded yet, may disappear. But the revitalization efforts of the Maori language may offer hope that many of these languages will endure well into the next century and beyond. Yes, yes. The best answers are those Thousands of miles away from his homeland, Dr. Timothy Karetu, a scholar recognized nationally and internationally for his knowledge of the Maori language, recently sat down with co-host Tad Johnson to discuss the issue of language preservation. Doctor, why is it important to preserve indigenous languages? Because it is the key to our cultures. No key to the culture, no knowledge of the culture, and the only key is the language. And it's a gospel that I preach everywhere I go. And I know it's difficult for some people to understand, but in the final analysis, if you're dancing to a text, as I have to in my culture, 
we dance to a text, and I'm sure you do too. Do you understand the text while you're dancing? Do you understand the movements that you're making to that particular text? And why do you do make those movements? And if you don't know the language and what's being sung in the text, then you're just being an automaton, really. You're just being a parrot the other way around. And it's, it's a harsh criticism, but you know, I'm finding it, it's, it's quite true of a lot of cultures, I think. Young people are taught to, to move to a rhythm, but without fully understanding whether why they're moving or why they're doing it. And that comes with age, I would hope. I hope there would be an eventual sort of comprehension of why. But that's one of the principal reasons why we need to know what we're, what we're, what we're talking about and what we're singing about. When, when the movement to revitalise started, there were about 80,000 native speakers still living. So that we had a good solid base to work on. And there were lots of younger ones too. But I think what we need is another census. That is not a proper census that figure I've given you. If they were to go around the country and count every individual, then we'd get a truly good picture of the number of speakers. But I think that's not a bad assessment over the years. Because, you know, we've been going on this whole thing since the late 60s. So it's been, we've been in doing it a long time. Regarding the fact that there are so few first speakers of the Ojibwe language, Dr. Keretu did offer some hope for the continuation of the language through second speakers. It's my firm belief, as I, my firm belief is that second language learners who are committed to the proposition of language survival and maintenance will ensure that the languages don't die. So I would not throw up my hands in horror and start sort of, you know, singing out my laments or all my dirges to the dead but in fact start doing something about keeping it alive by going to another generation. The language will change inevitably. It can't help but change because people coming into the language are coming from another culture linguistically and they would all be speakers of English. And the thinking in English, which they used to, will dominate the way they think in Ojibwe or Maori or any other language. It's up to us, the speakers, to, to ensure that in fact that is minimal rather than, than the maximum style of language. The complete transfer of idea to the, from one to the other doesn't always work. Um, and when it comes to, in our case, where cultural imperatives such as oratory in the formal situation is still a very demanding part of our culture for the sake of the tribe and its reputation, you must have good orators. And this generation now is wanting to be one of those orators. But then it demands a command of language which is, which is, out of the, which is above the ordinary. And a good command of mythology, proverbs, style, all those sorts of things are a mark of a good orator. And there's no guarantee that what worked for us will work for them. And that's what I keep saying. Because the work for us may not work for you, because your situation is slightly different from ours. And while our histories have a lot in common, our histories do have a lot in common, there's some salient differences. Um, and the, the biggest one, of course, as I'm saying to you, as I said to you before, there's only one language for the whole of New Zealand. The dialects are, are really not really true dialects in the sense that you can't understand, because our ancestors travelled the whole length of both islands to fight and to, to, to trade and to, to find women and to all sorts of things. So they were able to converse with each other. There, wasn't, there was never a problem. Um, I think what's going to happen when in, the great, uh, in the great washout, I think event, the eventual washout or wash up or whatever the right word is, the, the dialectal sounds will disappear and there will be one sort of standard language, I suspect, about 100 years from now. 50 to 100 years from now, that we are standard dialect. Dr. Karatu is also head of the National Maori Performing Arts Competition and is the recipient of many awards for his work with language preservation and revitalization. He believes that modern technology may help with these efforts, but it takes commitment. I think we'd have, we would have our heads in the sand if we didn't sort of acknowledge that technology is a help. But I think it shouldn't be to the exclusion of everything else. I think technology is there to help us in our battle for survival. And we should use it in that, in that guise, um, but never to become a slave to it. It should become a slave to us, and we should use it to the best of our ability. Uh, you know, uh, without technology, we would not have preserved all the archives that we have from our elders who are no longer with us. As long as there's a desire in the heart and a commitment, then all is possible. No desire, no commitment, nothing is possible. Because you're fighting not only the, the loss of language, but you're fighting the apathy and the top of your own culture. I'm talking about Maori now, and I'm sure it's true of the Lakota, and I hear Brian tells me it's also true of the Ojibwe. There will, be a, there will be a small portion who's totally committed to the proposition, and they're the ones you spend your time on. You just ignore the rest and say, I ain't wasting my time with a new lot, and I'm going with this lot. 
and that's how it's been working for me in New Zealand. We've, we've, con we've given all our energies to those who are committed and want this whole proposition to end up with the language being healthy. And it's already going that way now. Is that the most important thing for a language student uh, to... to uh yes, I think with no, with no motivation, you might as well give up, really. What's the point? It becomes an exercise and sort of, you know, going to class, having a snooze and going home. I mean, if, if you want language, your own language to survive, then there's no, there's no alternative. You need commitment, you need desire, you need the passion. And no passion, that, that's true of all things. Without passion, what, what is life? For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us at nativereport.org and Facebook. Thank you for spending this time with your friends and neighbors here on Native Report. I'm Stacy Thunder. We'll see you next time. Stacy Thunder is a member of and legal counsel for the Red Lake Nation, and Tad Johnson is a member of the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa and is chair for the American Indian Studies Department on the campus of the University of Minnesota Duluth. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community, the Malax Band of Ojibwe, and the Blandon Foundation. <laughs>